All right, good evening everyone. Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician at Gates Brain Health. Tonight I'm talking about management strategies for POTS. Uh, I've done several videos on POTS in the recent weeks, probably around six or seven. And now we are talking about treatment strategies that uh, other doctors are using and some that I use and Kind of what my thoughts are on the whole matter so we're going to go through this if you have any questions forward those to me uh, i'll try and answer as best as i can and then we'll go from there okie dokie okay so let me present from beginning here great again gates brain health in reno nevada all right so this is the first article that i'm going to present out of the journal of child neurology in 2020 and there's a lot of discussion now about different medications for POTS. POTS is an issue of blood pressure control and so it makes sense that the medical profession is going to use blood pressure blood pressure-esque medications to help with the condition. As I mentioned in the second broadcast I did on autoimmunity in the third broadcast basically 90 or excuse me 89% of POTS patients have antibodies to adrenaline receptors. What are antibodies? They're like immune cell Pac-Men and those antibodies can block the function of a chemical in our body like adrenaline and so or they may modulate adrenaline function and lead to more hyperactive adrenaline function as an example. So basically antibodies to receptors is not a good thing for POTS patients. We also see antibodies to acetylcholine receptors and that can be equally as problematic. That's seen in around 53% of POTS patients. So in essence, 89% of POTS patients are autoimmune having adrenaline antibodies and 53% of POTS patients also have acetylcholine receptor antibodies. That's important because then you'll have a better idea of why these medications are used. And so just a little review of the autonomic nervous system. Again, remember, and you can go back to those, probably that second or third, probably the third broadcast is the best one to look at, where I really diagrammed out the autonomic nervous system and how when you go to stand up, your body is going through a number of control mechanisms to stabilize your blood pressure. And for those of you who have POTS, those control mechanisms are disrupted or for all intents and purposes, not working correctly. And that involves the communication of your sympathetic nervous system, which is going to be affecting or going to be modulated through acetylcholine receptors at the first junction, the sympathetic chain ganglia, and then out at the second relay, we're going to have basically noradrenaline function. Just think of it as adrenaline. We'll simplify it. There's technically epinephrine and norepinephrine, but we don't need to get into those. Um, those nuances, so to speak. So with all that being said, in this journal article, they said there was some favorable effect and they reviewed a bunch of studies on POTS. They reviewed a lot of studies on POTS and they basically said, okay, out of 626 studies, eight studies met their selection criteria. So you can see how, how research is kind of dissected, so to speak. Lots of times you'll see on the news, people will say, well, there's no research for that. Well, that is actually a very uh, interesting terminology because when somebody says there's no research for that, they may mean that a huge meta-analysis uh, displayed that there wasn't a net effect based on every scientific study. There wasn't enough conclusive evidence in their opinion for there to be research. doesn't mean there's not research. doesn't mean there's not favorable research on it. Lots of times it's in the eyes of the researchers and their statis statistician lens that they look at research with to deem if something qual qualifies as being significant. So that's an aside. Nonetheless, they said there was some favorable effect. So out of those 626 studies, eight studies is what they looked at with 499 patients. And they said there was some favorable effect with fludrocortisone. Fludrocortisone, also known as Flornef, is basically going to act like aldosterone. Aldosterone, again, remember, affects how we save sodium and get rid of potassium at the level of the kidney. So aldosterone, the net effect of it is it improves blood volume. So some POTS patients are given medications that mimic aldosterone to increase fluid volume. 
probably not too surprising because some of your doctors may have told you drink more water, add more salt to your diet, all for the intent of increasing fluid volume. Beta blockers. What are beta blockers? Beta blockers affect adrenaline receptors, particularly in the heart and above the heart and lungs up and through the head. So beta blockers have their effect by modulating adrenaline receptors. And again, 89% of POTS patients have adrenaline antibodies or adrenaline receptor antibodies, excuse me. Mitodren, mitodren is also basically working similarly uh, on the, uh, basically the kidneys and saving uh, different electrolytes. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, those are your standard antidepressants. So in fact, antidepressants do have some positive effect for POTS patients. So that's pretty interesting. Um, so we have that. Now the next article, oh, I like this one because they kind of, they categorize POTS into different subgroups. They're, they're still referring to the, uh, the neuropathic POTS, which as I talked about in the neuropathy broadcast, um, you know, neuropathy was thought to be a cause of POTS. It still is by some individuals. I was very much talking about that literature when it first came out and even years afterwards where they've seen signs that the, the, the small fiber nerves, which typically are involved with pain and temperature, but they also affect things like blood flow. And so there were studies showing that the small fiber nerves showed some damage in POTS patients. Now that's up to question because of this really new information. Let me say it this way. Uh, relative to autoimmunity in POTS, we've suspected that that was an issue for many years. However, since 2007, when it first started being espoused up until now, Basically, study after study is showing that autoimmunity is more and more and more of a component for POTS patients. And the autoimmunity affects, again, as I mentioned, that communication from the spinal cord to the lower extremities through your autonomic nervous system. So quite possibly, the small fiber neuropathy that was being picked up in these studies may have been as a consequence of the autoimmune ganglionopathy, so to speak. Um, this autoimmune issue to adrenaline receptors or autoimmune issue to acetylcholine receptors. I hope that makes sense. Uh, if it doesn't, go back and watch the other broadcasts. Hypovolemic POTS, where in essence, there's just not enough fluid volume. I've seen some studies saying this is upwards of a third of POTS patients just have this thing called hypovolemic POTS. And then there's the hyperadrenergic POTS, which is in essence very much correlating with the autoimmune adrenaline receptor issue I talked about. And when that happens, then what happens? When your immune system is blocking the effect of adrenaline, then a natural consequence is for your, the center part of your adrenal gland to make more adrenaline and so that then can cause side effects and frequently the tachycardia and things like that associated with the POTS condition. So as you see here for hypovolemia, they're saying those patients don't really need pharmacological treatment. They more need salt supplements. They need oral rehydration solution, which is basically water and salt and fluid cortisone, so Florina. The neuropathic POTS patients are saying they don't need meds. They mainly need mitodrin and pyridostigmine. Pyridostigmine, also known as mestinon, is a acetylcholine esterase inhibitor. And as this medication is commonly used for a condition called myasthenia gravis. I'm not pres prescribing it. I'm just letting you know. If you read about it, it's usually used for myasthenia gravis, which is a, a condition, it's an autoimmune condition that typically causes people to have weak eyelids or they start to get double vision at the end of the day because their antibodies basically affect acetylcholine receptors. Well, doctors give those patients pyridosigmine because that medication in essence helps you to accumulate more acetylcholine in the synapse. So it's not broken down as much. Well, that's now being employed for a lot of POTS patients. So a lot of POTS patients that I see now are being put on the drug called mestinon, which was a myasthenia gravis treatment mainstay, and now they're being put on this, and a lot of them are having positive results. Why? Because 53% of POTS patients have acetylcholine receptor antibodies, but they're antibodies to one 
of the subunits of the G-coupled receptor. And when I did that talk, I referred to them as, you know, the little cylinder foam things in the pool known as pool noodles. I couldn't remember that term when I did the broadcast. So if you think of pool noodles and you took five pool noodles together, that's kind of analogous to a G-coupled acetylcholine receptor as an example. So that is where peridostigmine or mesonon is theoretically having its effect. And then the hyperadrenergic pots are saying uh, non-pharmacological treatments again, but also beta blockers like metropolol, propranolol. So that is what is being discussed. Are there other medications being discussed? Yes, but these are kind of the biggies. Um, in the research, you'll even find discussions on Wellbutrin, which is a dopamine-based antidepressant. Again, I'm not prescribing these. I'm just giving you the info. Efficacy uh, beta blockers on postural tachycardia syndrome in children and adolescents, a systematic review and meta-analysis. This was a good study where they basically took eight studies and looking at about 500 cases of pediatric POTS, so 497, and they found that all eight trials collected, collecting data on the effective rate of beta blockers showed that the efficacy of beta blockers were significantly higher than those of their comparable control treatments. This is out of Frontiers in Pediatrics, I think 2019. So you can see here that medications can be effective for POTS. Um, and even in this research article, they looked at two different types of beta blockers, I believe, and then also the beta blockers combined with the peridostigmine. And they basically found that all of the treatments worked in a comparable fashion. So you can look at these research articles uh, online if you have any questions. But the basic gist is that there are medication options out there for POTS patients. And many of you who have POTS will probably end up seeing a cardiologist. You may. Hopefully you see a cardiologist who's familiar with the condition. I have heard a lot of stories where cardiologists were not, the cardiologist the patient saw may not be completely uh, abreast of the new POTS literature, but it's also your job as a patient that you can bring information to your doctors. Because again, doctors lots of times are trying to rule out life-threatening conditions, particularly cardiologists. And for a young, healthy appearing person who has a 4.5 to 9, um, to one ratio of female to male, you know, a young, typically healthy appearing female who's presenting to a cardiologist's office, the cardiologist lots of times is scratching their head saying, why are you here? So you can inform them, um, you know, by letting them know based on all these broadcasts I've done, I've, I've tried to supply you with some good literature so you can start these discussions with your doctors. Now, if you're someone who is, does not want to take medications and you want to get to the root cause of the condition, uh, there are other options there that I have seen to produce some significant changes in patients that I've worked with. I'm not saying everybody, but I'm just saying I've seen the selected ones that I worked with. I've seen some neat changes. And there's a lot of discussion coming out of the Mayo Clinic that with POTS patients, we have to regulate fluid volume, but we can do more than that. We can use different compression hose, we can use different exercise regimens to help the POTS patient because POTS patients tend to get a deconditioning effect of their heart. Why? Because this whole dysregulation of adrenaline seems to negatively affect the heart to the point that when a person is finally stuck in bed most of the time and having trouble getting out of bed, that heart is just not exercised the way it needs to be. So there's a way to exercise the heart in a graded fashion while doing these other uh, treatment strategies to help that person start regulating their blood pressure better. I also feel that management of a person's diet is very important. Uh, most POTS patients have some gastrointestinal symptoms, whether it's you know nausea after eating or constipation or irritable bowel syndrome. It's all those symptoms are around 70 to 80 percent of POTS patients have those, or dysmotility where they have you know uh, poor gastric emptying and things like that. Gastroparesis is it's termed. So working with POTS patients diet, I have had some success with. And why is that? Well, the thought is that, you know, our gut bacteria is like, we have way more gut bacteria than we do cells in our body. And these gut bacteria produce byproducts that can then become inflammatory to the whole system. 
So whether or not it was purely an autoimmune syndrome that started your POTS, whether it was a viral infection that spurred an autoimmune attack against your adrenaline receptors, or maybe you received some other medical treatment, which I won't mention, and that then led to the development of POTS, well, all those things can start this autoimmune process, but there is the potentiality to augment the immune system through dietary and, and gut microbiome interventions. That's a whole new explosion of the microbiome. So I'm not saying that that is the cure for POTS. I'm not saying that, but I am saying that there's the potential uh, theoretically for that to happen. And I've worked with patients where I've seen these types of, of improvements. So it's all in what your proclivity is in terms of how do you want to be treated? There's definitely the mainstream medical route. The Mayo Clinic is doing a lot of good stuff with POTS. Uh, if you don't necessarily want to be on a medication-based approach, then looking at natural uh, treatment strategies is also an option, and that's something that I've really spent a lot of time on. Uh, also keep in mind, like with concussion patients, we're now finding that this, this entity referred to as post-concussion syndrome largely goes away when you either get rid of a low blood pressure that ensues after the concussion or POTS, uh, which in most of the POTS patients they describe typically, if I remember correctly, had low blood pressure and high heart rate. Most of you, you know, the diagnostic criteria is for a 30 point elevation in the heart rate. After 10 minutes or the head up tilt table test, 40 points if you're a child. So nonetheless, the brain has important control over POTS, particularly if you've had a head injury. So that's also something to keep in mind. There's also discussion about vitamin B1. Vitamin B1 referred to as thiamine. Thiamine uh, was found to be deficient in 6% of POTS patients in one study. So there's discussion out there online about using vitamin B1. So that's what I know at this point, again, you probably want to research Ehlers-Danlos syndrome as well, because maybe around 30% of POTS patients, maybe more, have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. So watch my broadcast on that. And let me know if you have any questions. So again, I'm not recommending you take these meds. I'm not telling you to take them, but I'm, I'm trying to get you the information from the literature showing that there's a lot of literature about medications being effective for POTS, but it's all in what you feel like doing in terms of your treatment. So good afternoon to those who joined me. I started this broadcast and then I had to abandon it because um, I didn't have the right slides up. But thank you for watching and have a lovely Friday night, everyone.